Well, I have come here to spend a year learning a bunch of stuff. Um, learning about what? Learning workflow mainly, um, software that can facilitate kind of fast prototyping of VR projects for a variety of different artists. So trying to look at a kind of big wide spectrum of different processes that can be um, applied to an artist's work that doesn't necessarily hasn't necessarily been brought into a 3D world before. So, oh, gotcha. Um, and not necessarily working with artists that that uh, deal primarily with spatial materials, but artists, you know, contemporary artists and traditional artists that uh, work in a variety of disciplines and just developing or, I guess, kind of collecting different workflows that can help bring that artist's ideas into a 3D environment to build partly assets but basically just to build um, spaces so that that forms part of the discussion of what kind of stories will be told in those little worlds. So kind of like a pre-res but yeah. for installation art mainly or is it stuff? Well originally I kind of set off to build pre projects to enable both artists to build 3D assets and to create prototypes of 3D spaces that we would then go and build as exhibition installations. Gotcha. So it was going to be like a two-way kind of thing. Uh, and the idea being that it would be a kind of simplified workflow for design departments and multimedia producers or multimedia practitioners who are working in museums mm. to be able to fast prototype these projects with visiting artists. So to build a kind of like a program of, of a resident artist that comes and... Um, works with both the exhibition designers and works with the multimedia developers and they just conceptualise a 3D um, experience and that experience either becomes a experience that you, um, that you delve into in a, you know, with VR equipment or it becomes something that you build the exhibition design team then kind of fabricates and the, you know, and, and the, the museum um, hosts an exhibition you know, in a th- in a three D or sorry in a physical world. So it is. Gotcha. It's it, it's designed to be a uh, a workflow that facilitates both the, the building of um, physical spaces or the conceptualising of virtual spaces. Um, it's not necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily that's dictating the the learning um, that I'm doing um, mm. primarily now. I think I'm probably looking. Um, a little bit more heavily into actual VR um, spaces, but uh, essentially I'm doing it so that I can then work in both. Oh, nice. Because my background is in yeah. working in a physical space, um, and I'm wanting to partly upskill so that I can mm. work in a 3D space, but um, also largely so that I can just effectively form discussion and and previous content for a three D world, so that that becomes more of a, an easier way of working with artists that are going to come into that world. So, what what kind of um, problems did you come across, or issues did you come across beforehand in the in which kind of led you to want to come here and learn a better workflow? Well, um, so my my background is in multimedia producing in a museum in an art museum, and I guess there's been quite a you know wide variety of projects that we've um, designed and built and, and um, staged for different exhibition spaces and there's various obstacles. I can't go into all of them because they're all way too um, so uh, painful to revisit. Um, yeah. No, not at all. No, no, they're just they're just kind of normal challenges. But some of those challenges are um, physical real world challenges, others are communication challenges. Mm. And, um, but I did notice that our role as multimedia um, producers were to, was to, my particular role was to um, either work with an artist or a curator and take an idea that they have and interpret that into a multimedia experience, whether it's you know an audio visual experience or an interactive experience or whatever. But in doing that, um, 
myself in particular, but also the, the team that I worked with, um, always felt like we needed to, we should be able to um, take those those suggestions, those ideas that the artists or the curators have, and actually, um, in some way, kind of build a more direct path to the artist's ideas or the artist's concerns, rather than the um, the medium that we were building in, which mm. was largely kind of documentary style, kind of interview based, you know, artist profiles, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of those um, projects were limited in that they were, in some ways, kind of way too close to being a, um, a marketing um, tool. Yeah. Um, and almost a, a way to um, uh, kind of communicate to an audience, both an online audience and, um, and a, an in-house audience, um, the profile of an artist um, from the perspective of the museum. But after doing it for quite a number of years, we always found ourselves um, kind of doing the same thing because mm -hmm. we had to build a story that could be broken into different parts to facilitate um, um, media campaigns, um, marketing mm -hmm. campaigns, and of course the um, the media assets that we actually in integrated into the exhibition spaces and all that kind of stuff. So you had to build from, say, one package of short form documentaries you had to build all these different kinds of um, communication channels for different things and essentially um, to enable that to be so flexible as you know as it needed to be we um, found ourselves making the same kind of thing we'd do an interview mm -hmm. we'd do a you know a studio visit we would do um, perhaps visit um, locations that were um, identified in the artist's work etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and it always seemed to be kind of leading towards the same thing, whereas we were particularly interested in, well, I was particularly interested in seeing how a, um, how we could build um, experiences that were more a psychological kind of interpretation of an artist's work and ideas, mm. um, and that idea being something that the um, artist could conjure up. And we didn't have the flexibility in our team to be able to do... To, you know, to, to build interpretive um, ideas around a whole bunch of different artists because artists all think very differently yeah. and approach their work very differently. Um, we really needed to maintain a streamlined um, approach to that kind of thing. So I kind of ended up um, leaving the museum largely because I um, wanted to focus on that kind of stuff. Mm. And um, so I went to do some research back in Australia um, at a university called Monash and um, did the background into... Um, moving from that kind of audio-visual design experience into um, a virtual or augmented experience using 3D um, tools. I didn't go into a production um, uh, research period until I arrived here. So I okay. just kind of was doing the background and looking at um, case studies that we had done at the art museum, case studies from other art museums, and looking at how those how immersion is used in museums, basically. Um, and so I've started looking at different aspects of that uh, and trying to use that as a springboard to um, to start the, the work that I would do coming here or going somewhere at the time yeah. it wasn't necessarily here because this course didn't exist. <laughs> um, the course that I'm here in yeah. Bristol um, participating in, but... Um, Were yeah, there so. other um, alternatives to immersion uh, and... What, what kind of kind of led you down the path? What kind of made you think that this this was the solution? I don't think I felt that this was the solution. I felt that immersion was very um, effective in um, taking uh, taking an idea and not being necessarily so literal about it, um, mm. because. Art museums have a history of, um, and this is partly due to their um, the kind of academic underpinnings of of um, curatorial teams and mm -hmm. conservation teams, um, and considering a lot of the curatorial professional teams um, 
started with the written word with you know um, with essays mm-hmm. um, which is largely how um, a an exhibition comes about you know the that process of building an exhibition a lot of it is is um, uh, either well the history the the brief history of the NGV, for example, <laughs> is that it used to be um, uh, an exhibition would um, would derive from a from an, from an essay or writings, yeah. academic writings about a um, an artist, um, and then that would manifest into an actual, you know, curated program, um, a physical exhibition, all that kind of stuff. The actual gallery about seven years ago decided that they wanted to take the the exhibition model and the design of the, the physical space and leave that at make that the the starting point for any exhibition. That's so cool. that that change was quite um, significant for the mm. NGV in that the design team and that included the multimedia team um, became the the beginnings of an exhibition. So an artist would come in and those conversations would start with the spatial designers mm. talking about what would be the physical experience of um, entering. Um, an exhibition and how would the the experience of the space um, curate, you know, yeah. a bunch of artworks or... Do you know of any other places which have done something like that? Are there any other real-world examples? Um, or online don't examples? don't think necessarily in Australia. Um, the American system for art museums is... is slightly different from from here um but there is certainly a a big cross-section of um design-led uh exhibition experiences Mm. um with uh academic-led um or essay-led um uh curated experiences so in australia though I, i think that uh, it was quite a difficult thing to integrate this into this exhibition, into this uh, museum, because it is the oldest museum in Australia and the biggest museum in Australia. Well, what was it called again? The National Gallery of Victoria. Oh, cool. So there's two. There is the National Gallery of Australia, but that is um, it's controversial why they're both called <laughs> National Galleries. But uh, the museum in Melbourne was um, was about 160 years old, so it, it kind of was the first one. At the time, Canberra didn't really exist so mm. um so it you know it's the national gallery of victoria however that aside <laughs> it um it has a very big collection uh and has a very um uh, very long uh, history of mm. academic um uh, structure behind it which um and it, that's amazing um so the the knowledge of the actual collection itself sits with the with a you know, a long history of curators. Um, so it's very difficult for an art museum like that to take to make that change. Mm. Um, and for good or bad, you know, it happened. Um, but it and when, was... When did it happen? It started in 2012. Okay, cool. 2013. Th- 2013 in earnest. Um, uh, with the arrival of two new directors, Tony Elwood and um, Andrew Clark. So it, it certainly changes the the way you know the um, that kind of cultural uh, program or that cultural experience within the museum um, was taking place and how they were created. Um, so it was you know it made a big difference for a multimedia team um, because we started building um, a lot more kind of complex experiences, mm. interactive experiences like uh, interactive rooms that used everything from. Um, motion capture um, sensors to um, pressure sensors to uh, um, photography, um, automated photography, um, touchscreens, obviously. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, ways we started to approach those kinds of things. Um, but it was that discussion with the artist that I thought could start taking place, um, could be more effective if it was if you could start having an art, a conversation with an artist about, um, about you know, in, in, a, in a spatial yeah. language, you know, and okay. to be able to quickly um, quickly design, iterate and determine what mm. th- that kind of um, space would be so that you could start talking about what the experience would be 
um, of the um, of the visitor. And until that point, we used to, I mean, we still do. They just still do. I'm not part, not there anymore. But um, they still build a three D model that they can pull apart and put back together again um, out of cardboard. Oh, um, nice. And they, you know, the scaled um, mm. the scaled exhibition space and. The artist comes in and, you know, tiny little miniature paintings are put on the walls of this tiny mm. little um, model without a roof and that's how they design exhibition spaces. They continue to do that. Um, and is that something which we kind of derived out of the, from the start or was that something which kind of developed over time? No, that's been a practice that okay. um, that, that museum has um, had in place for a long time. Okay. But it was usually the... The model was, um, I guess, in response to uh, a layout that the curator had um, uh, mm. prescribed for the exhibition um, based on the different um, subject areas of, of that artist's work mm. or the history of that collection, if it was from another museum or if it was a collection from a different a bunch of different museums. So uh, the model would usually just be a way of consolidating um, the the ideas of the curator and the directors um, into a physical you know visual model mm. for um, people to confirm that that's and then just use that to start considering um, uh, safe you know locomotion around mm. you know exhibition spaces for public looking for um, for uh, you know troublesome you know areas yeah. Um, which usually is a big thing with um, museums, looking for bottlenecks and that kind of stuff. Um, oh, yeah. So that's largely what they were doing for. But now, now they really do um, use the model as the beginnings of, of an exhibition. Um, it sounds like a similar thing to what theatre makers use. Like they can build models of very the much yeah. theatre and and architects as well. Actually, as well. Yeah. Just all yeah. Look, most architects. Um, We'll build a physical model mm. of something so that, and that's quite often you know, in response to a whole series of meetings and discussions with clients and that. Um, and then the the model is usually that first kind of opportunity to s- for a, you know a, a client or whatever to to um, visualize that scale, visualize that um, the relative you know dimension of spaces, mm. um, but. Uh, when you look at the technology that is available now, particularly with virtual reality, but also augmented reality or using HoloLenses, HoloLens um, technology, etc., cetera, um, to be able to create those models in a, um, in a virtual space and be able to modify those models, um, uh, completely rework those models and those spaces in real time with, with an artist, with a curator, with a... Um, an exhibition designer um, with a member of the public mm. you know like to be able to do that in real time um, could open the door to a whole lot of different you know um, physical experiences that um, the visitors have and um, you know just also streamline the process yeah. but I think making a you know getting being able to have come up with a, um, a virtual environment that you can have these conversations about space dimension um and uh, everything from acoustics to mm. um to to light all those kinds of things and if you can manipulate those kinds of um aspects of a future design or of a design and a future space um in real time with an artist then it frees up the artist to come up with interesting ideas and contribute those to and frees up designers to come up with interesting ideas to um build experiences that perhaps haven't been built before that sounds really cool, really fascinating. Do you think the that tool could be used as a as, a, as the art itself as well? I think so. I think um, like essentially, I I would like to think that if you were going to go and build, um, well, not so much build, but conceptualize, you know, an idea with an artist, mm. and you were going to use virtual reality technology, you know, at some point you're going to get to crossroads where you 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 have you, you can or you should discuss whether or not it should be a virtual or a physical experience. Mm. And there's no reason why it can't go down either path. I mean, uh, I think that 
or both. You know, like mm. it can be built into a physical space, but it can also be a, a virtual space, and you can do, you know, a lot in a virtual space. You can, um, you can build self-directed, you know, uh, story experiences into a into a virtual space more than you know, in, a, in a more effective way than you can in, in a physical space, mm. um, particularly in exhibition space when you've got larger numbers of people. Um, however, you've got um, you've got limitations with virtual reality technology, you know, at this stage and mm. using them in exhibition spaces. So, at some point, I think uh, using virtual reality as a design tool um, is um, is going to lead to, you know, changes in the design or changes in the idea that is affected by. Um, or aided by the the uh, the virtual design process mm. and um, and vice versa. So I think that the the, the actual um, ideas that are developed within those kinds of teams um, could lead to physical or virtual experiences. But I would like to think that the and, and one area I guess is the reason that I decided to leave um, that institution to do this was because I felt that solely virtual experience and a kind of a what's the best way to describe it a um a collection of uh, virtual um virtual reality environments that are almost kind of strung together you know in a, almost like a um minecraft for mm-hmm. you know for artists kind of thing mm. but um uh a collection of spaces that you can just simply visit that um, I guess heavily uh, heavily influenced by the by the artists um, psychological headspace when they design mm. and to have those spaces those um, environments accessible through one portal um, and you just and use that as a as a means to um, to introduce artists introduce artistic mm. concepts and different artists to a new audience so like that a those repository of um, uh, artists uh, exhibition spaces yeah or less so exhibition spaces and more so um, creative spaces mm. um, so the the kind of creative space that an artist that an artist uh, uh, working in um, as the physical objects yeah. come to fruition as those as those kind of um, physical um, artworks um, arrive see and how those artists kind of minds kind of like um, and shift and yeah in, according to the, the shape of the space mm-hmm. kind of like you're you've got all these kind of expression spaces molds and then you kind of go in with your like the molten glass and then blow the artist into that space yeah. And if those um, spaces are, you know, are constantly, um, uh, well, if they're experienced by different people, um, then the what the audience or visitor um, gets out of that experience is always going to be different from one mm. artist from one visitor to the next. Yeah. And if there is a way of of that con that communication or that conversation taking place between then the artist and the the visitor i guess in some ways it's it's a much more direct um line of communication mm. um one that doesn't necessarily mm. incorporate or rely on um on uh, an academic history of mm. art um both art terminology or uh artistic concepts that are um that have perhaps that are perhaps less accessible to to all audience members, mm. um, and I think that the that a, a virtual emporium, whatever you want to call it, um, not a, a virtual gallery space. It's not. I'm not interested in you know a, a virtual gallery space. Okay. Um, it's so um, still it's still a, a tool still in that realm of. Um, a resource rather than an experience oh no i think it's an experience what i mean is excuse me <coughs> it's a um 
it's not going down the path of creating um, a, a virtual. Um, so it's not like an entirely new virtual space. It's still based off. It's the not trying to gallery. simulate a gallery space where artworks are placed. Okay. Um, I, I believe that the physical art gallery is, you know, the best best way to do that. Um, I'm more interested in it being a um, uh, a state, um, oh. a virtual reality. Um, state that is akin to That's an artist's mind. Yeah. Um, that is, that is um, perhaps uh, addresses the, the challenges that an artist have has with you know materials, working with materials, mm. working with working with space, um, working in space, um, and that process of taking an idea that may exist only in your mind and then actually. Um, Translating that into a physical form, mm. in this case, a virtual form, but um, then like it, a it, test dummy area type thing. So you make this kind of exhibition space and then put it into this virtual tool that you've made, and then you can like feed in like crowd data and feed in material data. Uh, no, I don't want it necessarily to. I'm not. Um, I like the idea, yes, of of it becoming a. Um, broader kind of communication space but th I'm less interested in the the space itself being a um, highly interactive um, mm. environment which in many ways could substitute having you know touchscreen um, facilities in an exhibition space or watching a documentary on a projection or um, I don't want to bring those kinds of um, already existing medias necessarily into this space, but more a um, uh, more a, a state that um, that can be represented in um, visualizations that aren't necessarily going to that aren't necessarily um, linked to the artist's um, visual style. Gotcha. Or like they're not. It's not so much a, a, a you know a, a rendered space that is um, a virtual version of their physical mm. art. Um, it's more a a, um, a way of translating thought and um, artistic practice um, into a an experience. Whether it's just simply an environment that you just sit in. Mm. Um, that it is somewhat, you know, addressing the, the kind of environment that an artist relies on in order to clear their head and to become, um, to get them into themselves into a place where they can be creative. Um, I don't know, mm. don't necessarily um, feel that I've got that uh, resolved yet, but um, certainly a, um, you know, a space that has the simplicity of. Um, Well, that has a you know a um, that doesn't come cluttered with, with and loaded with certain um, uh, communication styles or familiar communication mm. styles that we've relied on you know in the past. Mm. It's more a way of creating a, a, a you know like a web of different um, different virtual reality experiences that people can access. Um, in a very different linear fashion than um, than they would walking through an exhibition, a curated mm. exhibition, or walking through a, like watching a fifteen minute um, documentary or anything like that. And there would be the kinds of spaces where you could just come back and visit any time. Mm. Um, and those spaces could lead to um, mm. another space of an mm. artist that has um, and that might be a very um, effective way, I guess, of introducing new artists to an audience mm. based on artists that they're interested in or using the visual kind of like environment a, itself for a visitor to explore that and for that that personal interest that personal eye that they yeah. have to um, draw them um, into another virtual reality um, experience that, that is linked so it's almost I guess a, a virtual curated experience but I'm imagining that it wouldn't be um, limited or um, exclusive to one ex one museum, it would mm. incorporate mm. artists that are represented in museums, um, both you know, 
locally, nationally, and internationally. Yeah. Eventually, some kind of um, some kind of network that is less a an online repository of um, short form documentary, which is exactly mm. what we were building at this museum, mm. um, and that was what we were building over time. And we wanted to build that. I mean, we were consciously trying to um, develop a a, um, a wide a variety of both audio and um, video based um, productions that would have, we, that we believed would become um, the, the documents of the 21st century that hmm. you know that the that museum already has a massive you know history of um, mm. publishing books because publishing the museum has this huge history of the NGV does have this huge history of um, publishing uh, physical books, hard, co- um, hard copy uh, essays, uh, and mm. an amazing history of that. But uh, the reality is, is that publishing in that format is not necessarily um, as widely embraced by mm. the public. And those books are um, both big and beautiful and um, reasonably expensive. Mm. Um, and the audience that are purchasing them um, is becoming less and less, particularly in Australia. I can't speak for museums in mm. Europe or um, or the US. Online sales, I guess, are the same. But, you know, the, that um, we were consciously trying to build vir- uh, video-based um, assets to, I guess, replace those. Mm. Um, but, again, then the experience that we were having as multimedia designers was that we felt that the that they weren't um, necessarily doing the artists the artist justice in a mm. way um, because so we were it's more like a simplified yeah version. and it was a you know a um, it was a, a soft overview of mm. what that um, you know of what that artist's uh, interests were and what the motivations were and. I think I felt that there could be a way of um, of exploring those um, without the without the museum itself being a, a visual player in that process. Um, okay. So, um, and that I guess that model that we were that we had was, that was playing out the production model that was playing out in a lot of our video was starting to look a bit same same. Mm. Um, since then, um, things have changed slightly. We have we did experiment with a variety of different um, short form documentary formats, but I, I definitely got to the point where I felt that, um, that there might be another you know another layer of um, communication um, or another layer of um, experiencing art that um, they had at home in virtual and augmented um, mm. experiences, and I think that that's. Um, Definitely, from from what I can gather, it feels like this this kind of virtual space is a a way of translating or like communicating the artist into the gallery space, um, or, or some kind of translation happening in this kind of virtual space where you're interpreting or communicating. I think is a better, a better term. Yeah. In, a, in a more of a purer sense than yeah, you can say that than yeah. what the essay or the video was doing. Yeah, it's I guess using or not using traditional language um, or um, uh, the history of language that we perhaps have used to um, document the um, document an artist's work or mm. artistic movements, but rather. Um, creating a, you know, a um, an accessible collection of experiences that represent um, those ideas that the artist has, um, or those environments that the artist relies on to create, um, or those uh, emotions that an artist has to endure or go through in order to um, mm. to produce their work, or just to just to be, you know, uh, an artistic. Um, do you think it's like practitioner. An, an intermediate space between the artist and the exhibition? 
Uh, I think it's... Um, it could be something that runs parallel, I think, to the exhibition. I would think that it doesn't necessarily need to um, align itself with an exhibition. Mm. Um, I think that the, the media that we, that we currently produce does that effectively. Mm. It talks about the event, you know, it talks about exhibitions and it communicates about the event of an exhibition and the, um, the I guess, the, the teams and the um, programs that encompass that event. Um, and I think that that as a, as a date stamper or that as a, um, uh, a document of, a, of events or of um, uh, certain exhibitions in a, in a gallery's um, history is, you know, is, is well... Um, we, we rely on both the you know, published medium, the, the, the written... Um, uh, catalog mm. as well as video stuff to do that and it already does that well so mm. I don't think this is is so attempting to replace it um, I don't think that it would use a very use the same kind of direct language um, or descriptive or um, um, and it, it's still it's principally um, a a way for you or the creative producers like yourself to work with the artists to figure out how they best want their work. How they best want to be represented, yeah. yeah. Um, and you do get a lot of artists who have strong opinions and strong feelings as mm. to what, um, how they are talked about, you know, how they are um, either reviewed, be it positively or negatively. Mm. Um, and so they, a lot of them have, you know, opinions about what they want to be said whereas if they were saying it a little bit more directly to an audience if they were um, perhaps uh, able to uh, to build a you know a very um, uh, intimate experience mm. um, that aligns itself with how they feel about their state of mind or their um, uh, particular um, the, that particular period of their practice mm. if they want to communicate that because that, that's I guess the, essentially the important thing is to in some ways create an experience that marks the experience of the artist at that particular time because mm. that's what exhibitions essentially are I mean you have retrospectives but um, my experience has been that capturing a document capturing a um, an exhibition itself marks a certain period in an artist's life and an artist's work evolves um, over the course of their their careers and, you know, we look back on their oeuvres and, and try and um, decipher what those artists were um, going through or experiencing, you know, at various times when they did specific exhibitions and what directions they were taking. Um, that is already, you know, I guess well-documented um, in the traditional mediums that we have, but I do think that this, um, these ideas that you could create virtual worlds that were simply about sitting and existing in, or just you know occupying these spaces mm. rather than um, rather than being instructed as to, um, or you know rather than the rather than interpreting um, an artist's. Um, current state through um, interviews and through mm. um, public programs and all those kinds of things. Yeah. You simply, um, the artist works with the designers, they build a space, they build an experience that uses both um, uh, 3D sound um, and um, a 3D environment or a, a, um, a virtual environment to convey those. Um, those emotions that they're experiencing and that, that psychological space that they um, that they occupy during the creative process. Do you think uh, there could be? Do you think that any any artists might struggle with that? With kind of I think so. Yes, opening I up. I think themselves. they will. Um, they often do, and um, but a lot of artists uh, are very, I guess. 
talented or um, or they have given a great deal of consideration to um, how they want to be interpreted. Mm. You know what kind of um, uh, what they're trying to say with their art and what they how they want to be remembered. How they want to be remembered. Yeah. Um, and many artists um, don't, whether it's through lack of concern of, um, or whether it's um, just not a um, not something that interests them. But I do think that a lot of artists are in touch with what um, motivates them to make art, what motivates them to to um, to constantly pursue original ideas. Mm. Um, I think that a lot of artists have uh, an acute awareness of the physical world that they experience and the psychological world that they experience and how that influences what they create. And whilst they may not all artists are able to articulate that mm. um, well, it could be that in some cases that they don't um, they're not necessarily uh, interested or comfortable trying to articulate it because it um, it is then uh, I guess expressed in a written mm. form. Um, but quite often an artist can. Um, I guess create a work or create a mm. you know an object or something like that that um, is their way of expressing themselves and um, a moment yeah and I think that if those um, if, if if you can as as a multimedia producer capture that in a way that can be developed and iterated upon mm. um, and shaped into something that is um, less about a study into an artist's mm. world and more about um, a sharing of that um, creative space that motivated the work or the collection that's on display, then I think that can be um, a very powerful way to um, connect um, a visitor to the artist yeah, themselves totally. rather than the showcasing of yeah. that, that work. So, um, I mean, this is a, an entirely new way of thinking about the kind of relationship between what the visitor um, interprets of as the artist and how the artist wants that visitor to think about them. Yeah. I mean, I, it's like I, it's like a whole new thing to me. I've, I've only just considered, like, there's like a small little paragraph, like a little plaque on the, on the side of gallery walls which kind of explains the artist, or like a little leaflet. Um, and that just doesn't do, doesn't do it justice, I don't think. Um, no. well, it, it might do in some cases, but the the idea of having a space where the artist can um, kind of communicate their their that their thoughts or their their ideas about that particular where they are in that space um, with their their art, which is on display, I think that's really cool. Mm. And it can be done <laughs> in many different ways. It can be done through a personal log, mm. you know. It can be an artist who simply records their thoughts mm. um, over a period of time creating a collection of work. Um, you know, that, that kind of um, recording of their log um, in privacy, you know, mm. where they can talk um, or just simply verbalise their, um, their feelings, their ideas and everything. Um, Without it being a, um, without it having to perform in an interview format, or without um, it being a um, a public, you know, mm. um, program, for example, or you know, like exposed to people um, who are anticipating their their responses, um, it can be um, documented through. Um, ideas that are recorded in scrapbooks or it can be documented um, in places that they visit mm. um, during that creative process. It can be cultures that they experience and the smells and sounds of it, mm. that those, um, that, those, that uh, witnessing those cultures, you know, um, conjures up for them. Mm. And, you know, like, and all those kinds of sensorial experiences that, um, that feed into um, an artist's creative um, work 
And would this, um, this, would this experience be exposed to the public as well as the creative producers, or would it, or would a version of it could be given to the the, the actual experiences of the, the of the exhibition, or is it exclusively just a translation? No, I, I would. I mean, I imagine that um, that it, you know, again, it's a, a process of interpreting. Um, what an artist has, or how an artist has recorded those experiences, mm -hmm. or um, or how an artist wants to, you know, what three D world does an artist want someone? What what experience is that that they want to place a you know an audience member in? So if it, if it's just a matter of coming up with that idea that that space that they want them to sit in, whether it's a completely empty room, mm -hmm. you know, like four walls and a floor and a ceiling. Um, a blank box or if it's you know a densely populated world in the wilderness somewhere mm. set in the wilderness um, I don't think it's so much about taking the materials that um, that have been captured by the artist to, to, to for them to articulate these these concerns um, and then presenting them as part of the exhibition or presenting them as um, the elements that they use to document them because I don't necessarily think this is about showing or communicating the process of the process of capturing mm. it's about communicating the the process of making art and if that ends up being through um, through uh, iterations of you know of designs or mm. if that ends up being um, you know, a travel history, or if that ends up being about a single moment that an idea came to them, and um, and the you know the connection that they had to that moment is you know is the most important and most powerful um, message that they want to convey, then that's what the experience would be. So it, it wouldn't you know I don't think limiting it to um, or reintroducing the, the materials themselves certainly the, certainly the assets that might be used might be things like their voice mm. you know existing in an actual virtual space and having the artist voice um, is, a, is a very powerful thing um, documentary is certainly shown that or observational documentary has certainly demonstrated that quite effectively uh, so you know the recorded voice is a, is a beautiful way for them to communicate. It's just a matter of how you, like what format that, that um, for instance, that uh, recorded voice is captured. And, you know, it's a very, very different um, communication style if it is, um, if it's pillow conversation, you mm. know, or versus, you know, a, a formal interview in, a, mm. in a, um, an exhibition hall or... Um, a visit to the artist's studio, you know, like they're, they're very, very different um, presentations of oneself, yeah. you know, like you do visit an artist's studio and it's because of the space is their comfort place and their, and their workspace, but they are also um, uh, responding to questions and, um, and prompts by uh, curators or whatever in order to to, um, to best shape a story about that artist. Um, the same thing applies to um, to how an audience um, or how a, an artist kind of responds in a public forum conversation about their mm. work. You know, like these are very, very, in, in many ways, constructed um, presentations of that artist. Mm. And um, that's not necessarily you know, how what artists want to um, communicate their ideas to most artists just want to use their, um, well, from my experience, most a lot of artists just want to use their artwork to yeah. communicate to audiences and they don't necessarily want to, but some really, really enjoy that, um, that conversation that, um, with the general public and how they can, you know, how they can shed more light on, mm. their, on their work and how they can um, explore and discover more mm. aspects of but it. you never know what I mean there's so, so many different ways in which you can um, capture that um, that inner conversation that an artist is having so and it might be a way of you know 
animating those scrapbooks that they that they may mm. work with, or simply um, exploring the process of the material that they use, experience, exploring the process of the fabrics that they use mm. to actually mould and sculpt and um, and build uh, physical objects. Or um, I mean, there's a myriad of you know different approaches you can take to those kinds of things, and I think that. Being able to, and this is something that I just think that the museum, um, there's an opportunity for a museum or for creative teams that run either par in parallel with museums or that are working from within museums um, can expand that um, the communication, I guess that communication vehicle or the communication space that they mm. um, that they have at their disposal um, by using virtual technologies. And there's you know the software for artists to work in a 3D space has also changed mm. that landscape as well. I mean, uh, there are different um, uh, creative tools native to, um, to a VR environment that an artist can actually use to um, paint directly onto a, a 3D canvas. Yeah. And um, there is also, you know, spatial sound techniques that you can um, easily and quickly apply to um, to virtual uh, spaces that um, that can simulate the, the kind of um, uh, inner sonic visualization that mm. is taking place. You know, um, particularly when you're thinking about how um, sound artists work or um, how performance artists work. So there's lots of um, certainly you know. A huge number of um, possibilities and avenues that um, that spatial technologies like VR and, and AR can, can bring to that kind of new form of communication. But I just think that it, it's a very difficult and challenging thing for um, state-run museums to to take on complex VR and AR projects. Mm -hmm. It does require an enormous, you know, cross-section of skills and um, and um, knowledge and it's unrealistic whilst you know the museum that I came from certainly I was well resourced um, mm. for financially and um, uh, and physical resources like and personnel resources um, but that's still you know we, we were still required to um, I guess produce volume um, sometimes volume over mm. quality um, in some ways um, or volume over content rather um, in order to make the most out of the resources that we had so there aren't you know there aren't a lot of state museums that, that do have uh, significant funding in that in that area mm. um, they're, you know, they're very expensive you know shows to put on exhibitions um, particularly as the, the physical spaces and the design of the spaces become more and more mm. elaborate. Um, so it's unrealistic necessarily to think that museums can just take on these, um, uh, these the skill sets to do this kind mm. of work. But, the, but as the, um, the technology itself becomes far more accessible than it ever has been, mm. um, designers in working in um, exhibition teams um, are certainly, you know, well positioned to simply work with an artist to prototype an idea. Mm. Um, and if they can quickly and effectively um, establish, you know, the 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 um, the content format or the platform in which mm -hmm. the the artist wants to communicate through. Um, then those ideas can then be, you know, I guess, um, brought to fruition through um, creative companies and creative teams mm. that work in parallel with or alongside exhibition, uh, alongside um, museums. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is soon to be a, you know, a, um, a production area that a mm. museum is, that a, an art museum is in a position to, um, to take on as, you know, core production. Mm. But it's certainly... Um, considering, you know, we look at where things are at in 50 years' time, the way you um, access um, the, the types of um, 
you know, uh, interpretive material that surrounds and supports exhibitions mm. is most likely going to be experienced in yeah. um, in a digital format that um, that when we look back, you know, in fifty years' time, <laughs> if I live that long, um, y- you know. Um, we, we can't imagine what that what those formats are actually going to be, um, how you know, and we can't really imagine what an exhibition space is going to be, you know, in fifty years time. Um, but we can assume that if the um, if the materials or the um, those experiences that uh, capture these particular periods or aspects of an artist's um, life and work. Um, if we can ensure that, that those ideas are heavily influenced by the vision of the artist, then we can assume that they're going to be wide and varied and mm. um, certainly, hopefully, they're accessible through, you know, some kind of unified format that, mm. um, that allows those things to live on. I mean, the beautiful thing is the books and catalogues are going to live on. They're going to stay there. Um, and they're physical objects that um, that won't rely on technology to to um, to be able to play them to be able to play back. So mm. um, you can rest, you know, in comfort there. Mm. But um, but there is, you know, I think that as the as the ideas that artists actually the, the ideas behind artists' projects evolve, so does the um, the need to experiment and explore different ways of communicating what they're um, what they're experiencing when making art and I think that, that is a responsibility of art museums mm. um, and cultural institutions in general um, so you, uh, you mentioned at the beginning about pipelines and, and workflow in terms um, of finding out like the best workflow for that kind of thing um, using what you've kind of learned so far being here in the, and on the course how how do you think you have an answer for like how long a that, that kind of workflow will take? No, I don't. Um, I don't. Um, I don't really imagine it's going to be possible to determine how long it, you know these kinds mm. of projects could take. I think there is certainly kind of limitations, and you know. Um, to, to the kind of times that the t- times of production or pre-production periods that can be um, allocated to design teams in museums to develop these kinds of things um, but I guess the, the kinds of workflows that I'm trying to explore are um, are different types of um, software environments um, or different forms of um, physical world capture mm. or different ways of connecting those different production processes to, together mm. um, and, and looking at simplified yeah. versions of those things mm. um, so, that a, um, so that you can fairly quickly and easily identify what... Um, what production area might lend itself well to a particular team, yeah. or um, you know, or uh, the way you invite an artist to contribute to these to these kinds of ideas, or the way you invite an artist in to to um, start that process, relies heavily on the the format in which you um, first place them in. Yeah. I mean that, that I guess. Uh, that's extremely critical and that is certainly um, something that I'm trying to look at as to how you introduce uh, a 3D creative environment to a, an artist, a virtual 3D creative mm. environment to an artist that, um, that is either A, never seen virtual reality before mm. or um, hasn't necessarily uh, considered how you can manipulate um, 3D objects or how you can <laughs> moderate um, or manip- uh, 3D um, spaces or objects or, I- or ideas that exist in that 
virtual world, how you can do that if they haven't mm. ever considered that and you invite them to that, you know, that process and that experience with the wrong um, technology, mm. then you can lose them forever. Yeah. So I guess my, my interest is to just identify really what, um, um, what some of those different kinds of production processes might be. Um, and certainly not to become the master of <laughs> all of them or any of them, but um, just to identify what the, um, the pros and cons are yeah. um, to and determine what you know level of complexity is involved in in each of these kinds of um, production areas, and you know what how they what they serve you know mm. like how they um, how they used how they um, how they fit with um, with the artist's interests, um, how they fit with the, um, uh, both with the designers and the curators' mm. interests as well. Um, I still think that the experience of, of uh, communicating with the artist should be um, one that exists between the curator and the, um, and the artist. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that the technology should then become something that means that that conversation takes place between the, the um, or that way of developing takes place between the designer and the, um, oh, gotcha. and the artist. I, I, I think that the designer should certainly be, um, play a major role in that, mm. um, an equal role of the curator, but I, I still think that using the technologies um, in many ways has to be something that also brings the curatorial teams on board mm -hmm. um, so that the curator, curators themselves in, in some way are um, are inviting the artist to that space and are invited into that space um, and facilitated by both design teams and the technology that they um, that they perhaps become a bit a little bit more acquainted with mm. um, and it may be that this doesn't you know this isn't something that exhibition or museum teams do um, in-house but uh, are equipped with the kinds of um, simple workflows or technologies um, to be able to um, start that process, start the conversation off with with artists, just get them into virtual experiences that they can perhaps then establish a you know a communication in a style. Mm. Um, because you know, if, you, if you've got virtual reality technology in a museum, there's so many other ways you can use it as well. I mean, yeah. you can use it simply for previews of an exhibition mm -hmm. space. You can use it to to support um, the fabricators and builders who build those spaces. Yeah. You can use it for egress purposes. You can use it for um, accessibility purposes. You can use you can use it simply to um, do all your lighting design. I mean, the complexities of of putting exhibition lighting into into place, particularly. Um, oh. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, th I think that you know the more familiar the design teams and multimedia teams are with um, with immersive technology, uh, will open the door to huge, like you know, a huge array of different um, applications in the museum space, mm. um, which certainly streamline the um, the workflow, you know, the general workflow of it. Of creating exhibitions and creating events, um, particularly you know, because events take a lot of design and um, and a lot of uh, pre-production work goes into them. And in my experience, uh, having um, having virtual uh, technologies to uh, design those would have been enormously helpful mm. to be able to bring sound and vision into a into a virtual space. Um, so these technologies can just be, you know, if they are um, made made useful within design teams, then and they become more, I guess, um, familiar with technologies and how they can be used and how they can be applied. And then um, over time, as we identify um, specific workflows that um, are, you know, straightforward enough for them to take on. Um, then those can be introduced to those teams over time, and then mm. that process can be then something that is actually managed in in house rather than by production companies. Um, uh, because you know it's not a cheap sport, so yeah. 
it's um it's, it's very difficult for on one hand it's very difficult to um sustain um virtual reality or augmented reality production um in that particular arena mm -hmm. um, in the art world um but it seems to me that the the world that we might create or the experience that we might create with virtual reality if it's not led by artists then it it's going to become pretty formulaic mm -hmm. pretty quickly and um and i don't think that uh we'll benefit from that and i i think that that's the same case with, with games mm. um you know like games are going to be games are evolving from um from this pursuit of photorealistic experiences, um, first-person shooter photorealistic experiences um, already. And so the more artists or artist-led teams, uh, fine artist-led teams um, that influence the, the look and feel of those experiences might also um, accelerate that shift um, of you know, gamified art mm. um, into um, experiences that are, um, I guess, to me, are probably more interesting than than um, than first person shooter type of experiences. Mm. Um, and I yeah, think totally. that if you can um, if you can create worlds uh, based on the vision of um, artists, that that idea or that adoption of um, of spatial immersion is um is far more interesting than, than trying to achieve that through photorealistic experience mm. um and which is you know but um do you have a an artist that you'd like that would love to work with uh or have worked with and would love to work with again with this kind of tool um Yes, I guess so. There's well, there's certainly one artist that I really want to develop a work with, Kirsten Berg, who's a Melbourne-based uh, artist, Melbourne, Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, her art, particularly over the last kind of five years, has moved from a frame-based um, wall-mounted work space or uh, kind of. Um, a canvas into three-dimensional um, space so I guess objects mm -hmm. um, the, the construction of objects um, and environmental you know elements that um, and I think that's you know like it's an interesting kind of area to take an artist like that into when they're going through that process of moving from that um, more traditional way of exhibiting into the you know into mm. the spatial um, that spatial domain or much m more spatial um, than the um, than a white cube with you know works yeah. on the wall. Um, so I'd love to work with her in this area. Um, Any particular museums you'd like to work with? Any particular exhibition spaces that you feel would be interesting? I would like to see those kinds of exhibitions. I'd, I'd like to see them outside the museum exhibition spaces, and mm. and for a museum to think about um, the resources that they have um, to exhibiting in more interesting, um, so outside non traditional, in the yeah, non traditional um, exhibition environments, and a lot of museums are doing it where the exhibition spaces have crept uh, out from those designated mm. you know white walled spaces mm. into the foyers and into the gardens and yeah. you know so that's certainly happening already and i think that that's that's uh, that's great but it could you know also expand into historic buildings into um, um community spaces um art is obviously you know extending into community spaces already that's not that's nothing new but mm. um but i would um yeah, it's not a particular museum that I would necessarily uh, feel the need to um, that I would you know necessarily mm. connect um, to. Um, and there's lots of museums that I'd like to work with, but um, <laughs> but not necessarily with Kirsten's work. But there are other artists that I'd love to see explore. You know, 
virtual mediums. Um, Richard Moss has been very influential. He's an Irish artist, um, and he certainly he's um, he deals with kind of nonlinear um, video. Um, uh, processing. Oh um, yeah. Okay. Of um, he, the subject matter is um, is you know stretches from um, refugee um, you know um, migrant migrating um, refugee communities mm-hmm. to um, war stricken um, mm-hmm. you know the desolation of um, of communities. Um, uh, in war zones to yeah all sorts of um, very difficult and challenging you know environments and I'll, I'd be interested to see how he would enter that world of virtual um, or augmented art mm. um, and how he would particularly augmented art um, I think that would be a very very interesting and powerful uh, um, concept to look out for um, but look, there's been a number of artists that I've that I've um, been amazed with that I think would be interesting. But those two would probably, you know, be um, be really cool. Be really cool. <laughs> Very cool. Neat. Well, I think we'll end there because that was super fascinating. Cool. Um, really eye-opening, actually, to kind of have that your kind of perspective on that kind of really small. Um, kind of veil between artist and exhibition space, and like, um, and the and the and the role that kind of the curator and creative producers have in translating the artist into that space, and then how VR can assist in that. I think I, I didn't even consider it, and I think it's awesome. <laughs> well, I think it's really cool. It's an interesting area. I think. Yeah. It's, um, and I think that role of. I'm really excited to see. Will change over, yeah, you know, the, that kind like of the technology will change those roles. I think. Yeah. Um, totally. You know, those kind of the separated roles within those kinds of institutions um, mm. are not as clear anymore. And I think yeah. that um, that there's certainly going to be, you know, a lot of crossover. Um, and I'm seeing that. I was, you know, yeah. I was seeing that in the museum that I used to be at, based at. Um, but I think that that will change more and more as the technology changes the yeah. format of exhibition. Totally. Awesome. Thanks Jedi. very much for your time. <laughs>